Hey guys, welcome back, and if you're new here, welcome to the channel. Today we're celebrating Tolkien Reading Day, an annual event organized by the Tolkien Society. The theme chosen for 2024 is Service and Sacrifice, and while there are plenty of examples of this theme in Tolkien's Middle-earth writings, today I'm looking at one of Tolkien's shorter works that are not related to his legendarium, a story titled Leaf by Niggle. Set in a vaguely modern context, the story tells about a painter named Niggle, who knows he will soon have to go on a journey, and is struggling to finish his masterpiece, a painting of a great tree, before his departure. He's frequently pulled away from his work by outside obligations, and finally catches a serious illness while running an errand for his tiresome neighbor, a man named Parrish, who has no interest in Niggle's art and whose only redeeming quality seems to be his knack for growing produce. Before Niggle can recover enough to really resume work on his tree, the inspector of houses arrives to claim his canvases, saying they ought to be used to repair his and his neighbor's roofs. An imposing driver then comes to whisk Niggle off on his journey. Because Niggle hasn't made the right preparations, upon arriving at his dimly described destination, he's put into the workhouse. After a long period of exhausting toil, he is ordered to rest, and overhears a debate between two voices, one who judges Niggle's life and character harshly, the other who argues for what he calls gentle treatment. The merciful second voice prevails, and Niggle is released to a green open land where he encounters a living realization of the tree from his painting, along with a whole forest's worth of other trees that he'd only distantly imagined before. He realizes he needs the skill and knowledge of someone like Parrish to properly develop the region's potential. Sure enough, he almost immediately runs into Parrish, and together the two men cultivate the actualized world of Niggle's picture until it is a perfect realization of all Niggle had ever imagined. When he is ready, he continues his journey on toward the mountains, leaving Parrish to wait for his wife. Meanwhile, we hear that Niggle's old house has been repossessed, his name mostly forgotten, and his picture almost completely destroyed, except for one fragment. Titled Leaf by Niggle, it's preserved for a while, and proves strangely compelling to those few people who notice it. The story ends with the second voice explaining that the world Niggle and Paris shaped has been useful in preparing others to set out for the distant mountains themselves. Now, it's well known that Tolkien professed a dislike of conscious allegory, preferring to describe the principles presented in his work as applicable. Leaf by Niggle, though, is a special case. Tolkien described the story as part apologia, part confession, writing, I woke up one morning with that odd thing virtually complete in my head. It took only a few hours to get down and then copy out. If not a direct allegory, the story is perhaps best understood as a fable or parable for how Tolkien perceived his own artistic endeavors and their place in the universe. Niggle's work habits and struggle to finish his life's work in the face of interruptions are very like Tolkien's own. The journey Niggle must take is a metaphor for death. His stay in the workhouse is analogous to the concept of purgatory, and the distant mountains represent some idea of heaven or a progression toward ultimate reality. Apart from its entertainment value, the story is generally appreciated for the light it sheds on Tolkien's belief about art and subcreation, as well as his own experiences of creative work. However, today I'm looking at another theme present in the story, the role of sacrifice in art and the concept of art as indissoluble from service. Part 1. Niggle's Nonsense, or The Wrong Kind of Sacrifice As the story begins, readers are inclined to sympathize with Niggle, a humble man of somewhat romantic temperament who just wants to lose himself in his work, bringing into being a vision of beauty. However, the story is not framed as an account of pure creative expression being trammeled by onerous daily considerations. Rather, it explores the relationship between Niggle's interpersonal and artistic duties, and the ways he fails to properly approach them. From the beginning, laying aside all question of interruptions and obligations, Niggle's creative process is shown to be disordered, overly indulgent, and lacking in proper perspective. Even when he could and should be working on his project, he often doesn't due to idleness. This is particularly concerning because inspiration is wont to strike at inconvenient times. Even when Niggle does make time to work on his painting, he often finds himself unable to access or execute the ideas that flow so readily when he should be occupied with other things. Almost everyone is familiar with this experience, particularly those with an artistic or creative bent themselves. 
But while this phenomenon might be inevitable to some extent, Niggles' experiences later in the story suggest he has more control than he thinks. During his stay in the workhouse, Niggle learns how to take up a task the moment one bell rang, and lay it aside promptly the moment the next one went, all tidy and ready to be continued at the right time. He got through quite a lot in a day now. He finished small things off neatly. On top of that, when Niggle does work on his picture, he often eschews focusing on the tree overall, in favor of laboring over individual leaves. Here his fault is not indolence, but a lack of perspective, both artistic and philosophical. After all, the real power of the painting, both for Niggle and those who will later appreciate it, is not in the leaves or even really the tree itself, but the way the tree frames the distant mountains of the background. That's not to say that Niggle should be trying to paint the mountains instead. The very source of their appeal is that they can only be distantly and faintly seen. Tolkien would later make comparable comments about his own work. Part of the attraction of The Lord of the Rings is, I think, due to the glimpses of a large history in the background. To go there is to destroy the magic, unless new, unattainable vistas are again revealed. According to the story, Niggle, like Tolkien, understands that the real beauty of the tree does not rest on the execution of individual leaves, so his preference for focusing on them is just that a preference, and one he indulges in at his peril. For Niggle's time to work on the painting is not unlimited. There's his fast-approaching involuntary journey, of course, and he's often pulled away from his creation to attend to other tiresome duties. However, as the story progresses, the reader and Niggle notice that his negligent attitude toward these demands have further shortened the overall time he's given to work on his tree. When Niggle agrees to help Parrish for the final time, it's only after a crisis has struck. Parrish's roof is not only deteriorating, but actively leaking. Mrs. Parrish has already fallen ill, and Parrish's own health continues to be so bad he can't do much to solve these problems himself. Even after Niggle contacts the doctor and the builder, it takes them some time to respond, by which point Niggle himself has fallen ill due to the necessity of riding through the rain at the last minute and the holes that have appeared in his own roof. Niggle later laments that if only he'd taken a more proactive approach to the problems he had spent so much time avoiding, they could have been resolved without costing so much time. One thing he kept on repeating to himself as he lay in the dark, I wish I had called on Parrish the first morning after the high winds began. I meant to. The first loose tiles would have been easy to fix. Then I should have had a week longer. Niggle is forced to sacrifice the possibility of completing his painting to help his neighbor in an emergency, but this sacrifice might never have been called for if Niggle had taken proper care not only with his neighbor's well-being, but with safeguarding his own time to work. As it is, Niggle is summoned to leave his painting and begin his final journey before he feels ready to. He cries that his tree isn't even finished, to which the inspector somewhat brutally says it's finished with before the driver hustles him on his way. As we see later in the story, Niggle's tree will only be truly finished in the land he's released to after his journey, where he sees it perfected, no longer static in time but organically growing, given a three-dimensional reality that he could never have achieved with paint alone. The harsh truth is that if left to his own devices, Niggle would never have been finished with his painting of the tree either. For whatever reason, be it external circumstances, or personal failings, or a combination of both, Niggle had gone as far as he could on his own, without developing the necessary diligence and proper attitude toward his work, even if given an infinite lifetime, the odds are he would only have gone on niggling. Part 2. Strengthened by Service After the first leg of his journey, Niggle undergoes a purgatorial experience in the workhouse. Again, the story tells us that his own lack of perspective and pragmatism makes this necessary. Caught by surprise, he's entirely unprepared for the journey that he's known about for a long time. All he brings with him on the train is a bag of art supplies, but even this was not properly thought out and set in order. Instead, it was snatched up by accident, so it too is stripped from him. He doesn't even remember to bring it off the train. As a result, Niggle must work off his debts by finishing a variety of menial tasks at a hospital. As unpleasant as it is to be separated from his art supplies and made to focus entirely on the needs of others, Niggle finally develops the abilities he lacked earlier. 
The story implies that indeed the only way he could have gained this strength of character is through this dedication to sacrificial service. If he worried at all after that, it was about his jobs in the hospital. He planned them out, thinking how quickly he could stop that board creaking, or rehang that door, or mend that table leg. Probably he really became rather useful. He had no time of his own, except alone in his bed cell, and yet he was becoming master of his time. He began to know just what he could do with it. Earlier in the story, Niggle is described as kind-hearted in a way, but a caveat is immediately added. You know the sort of kind heart. It made him uncomfortable more often than it made him do anything. And even when he did anything, it did not prevent him from grumbling, losing his temper, and swearing, mostly to himself. The narrator and Niggle both seem to view his so-called kind-heartedness as a flaw rather than a virtue. Niggle himself derides his own nature as weak, and suspects he would make much more progress on his work if he could be strong-willed and harder of heart. He attends to his other duties, including his duties to others, only when he could not get out of them, and with a heart that's often merely soft without feeling at all kind. In the overheard Court of Inquiry, the second voice argues that even Niggle's reluctant service to perish is to his credit, calling it a true sacrifice, because Niggle chose to do his duty even though he sensed what was at risk and suspected his actions would be for nothing. However, as the first voice observes, this and other deeds were done out of a sense of obligation rather than real compassion or charity, which reduces their worth. The virtue of pity has tremendous value in Tolkien's other writings, especially The Lord of the Rings, where the whole fate of the world rests on a few well-timed instances of characters being moved by pity to act against their better judgment. So it's interesting to observe that Niggle performs similar acts of service and sacrifice without this kind of heartfelt pity as a motive. Despite blaming the softness of his heart for the time he spends in service to others, Niggle isn't described as being emotionally moved by the experience of pity. Instead, he spends almost the whole time resenting the interruptions to his work. As a result, he continues to suffer from the very character defects that limit his artistic achievement. In the workhouse, Niggle's bad habits are literally worked out of him, and after he learns to work without complaint, he develops the true strength of character that allows him to express belated concern and appreciation for his dull neighbor Parrish. I should like to see him again. I hope he is not very ill. Can you cure his leg? It used to give him a wretched time. He was a very good neighbor, and let me have excellent potatoes, very cheap, which saved me a lot of time. Only after he has shown this capacity for something like positive pity is Niggle deemed sufficiently recovered from his moral illness to progress on his journey. Upon being granted parole and taking another train ride, Niggle comes across not his painting or his sketchbook, but his bicycle, a possession he last used in performing his literally fatal service to the parishes. This time, however, instead of carrying him away from his work, it takes him toward the finished tree which is now a living and growing entity. The tree's perfection is partly due to Tolkien's concepts of the platonic ideals of the afterlife, but it also has a more immediately applicable significance. In his previous life, Niggle understood that art had to be subordinate to service, and as frustrating as he may have found it, he did choose to help his neighbors in the end. What he didn't understand was that sacrifice, if rightly approached, could have actually enhanced his creativity. In fact, sacrifice was in some ways necessary to achieve even the end of art in itself. The bicycle that was once a tool of this sacrifice now carries Niggle on to a more fully realized artistic achievement. Moreover, because of Niggle's improved perspective, he has a greater awareness and appreciation of everything he once tried to express through his art, from the other beautiful but incomplete trees of the forest to the distant mountains that previously he could only ever suggest in the background. Now Niggle finds he is able to gradually approach the mountains, but getting closer to them no longer detracts from their magnificence. Part 3. Niggle's Parish, or Art, Service, and Community Niggle's expanded perspective now also extends to Parish. We've already seen him go from resenting him to feeling authentic compassion for him. Now that the images of his art have been brought to life, Niggle has just realized that he needs Parrish's skill and experience with plants when, lo and behold, Parrish himself appears. 
In many ways, the character of Parrish recalls Tolkien's thoughts about an unennobled Sam Gamgee. Stripped of Sam's humility and sense of wonder, Parrish demonstrates what Tolkien identified as the negative aspects of a hobbitish pragmatism, a mental myopia which is proud of itself, and a readiness to measure and sum up all things from a limited experience, largely enshrined in sententious traditional wisdom. While the story never questions the justice of Parrish's claim on Niggle, it doesn't exactly represent him as a paragon of unfairly injured innocence. Parrish was happy to nag Niggle about the state of his garden, but he considers it the height of charity to not inquire about Niggle's nonsensical daubings. He shows little gratitude for Niggle's help and doesn't bother to offer any help in return when Niggle himself winds up sick in bed. Even in the world of Niggle's painting, presumably after he started his own convalescence, Parrish retains traces of the limp that limited his capabilities in life. And while Niggle and Parrish find it much easier to work together, they still have arguments and need to take occasional doses of a bitter tonic as their tolerance for work and for each other's company slowly increases. Another transformation the two undergo during their collaboration is a reversal of their original roles. As they worked together, it became plain that Niggle was now the better of the two at ordering his time and getting things done. Oddly enough, it was Niggle who became most absorbed in building and gardening, while Parrish often wandered about, looking at trees, and especially at the tree. In each case, this change represents the next step of the character's maturation, and to complete it, each man requires the participation of the other. Through his completely disinterested sacrificial service in the hospital, Niggle has already become master of his own time, but he still needs Parrish's expertise to truly bring his artistic vision into reality. And as a result, a lot of Parrish's individual thoughts end up expressed in the landscape. Niggle would think of wonderful new flowers and plants, and Parrish always knew exactly how to set them and where they would do best. Parrish, previously small-minded and self-absorbed, undergoes an ennoblement of his own, learning to appreciate the unique beauty of these expressions, as well as their usefulness and organization. When their work nears completion, Niggle has finally fulfilled his frustrated creative impulses and is ready to go on to something new. Parrish stays behind, waiting for his wife. Despite all his growth and his close collaboration with Niggle, it's only when he asks a guide for the name of the country that he realizes that he's been living inside the world his neighbor had been trying to depict in paintings for years. Having come to appreciate its beauty from the inside, and even help create it, Parrish is quite rightly aghast that he had held such scorn for Niggle's work earlier. In keeping with his newly expanded perspective, Niggle no longer resents Parrish's indifference, confessing that if Parrish never showed much interest in the tree, Niggle never made much effort to really share the beauty of the tree with him. And with a chronically painful leg, a deteriorating house, a wife to support, a flighty, potato-less neighbor, and his own unforgiving vocation of gardening to contend with, Parrish probably didn't have the bandwidth to appreciate such an explanation, even if Niggle had offered it. Plus, it's not until very late in the game that Niggle even bothered to conceive of the painting as a finished product, valuing it for its possible effect on others rather than for the private pleasure he takes in working on it. One day, Niggle stood a little way off from his picture and considered it with unusual attention and detachment. He could not make up his mind what he thought about it, and wished he had some friend who would tell him what to think. Even on this occasion, rather than a truly external perspective, what he really wants is self-serving validation, and for the worth of his painting to excuse him from all his other irritating duties. What he would have liked at that moment would have been to see himself walk in and slap him on the back and say with obvious sincerity, Absolutely magnificent. I see exactly what you are getting at. Do get on with it and don't bother about anything else. We will arrange for a public pension so that you need not. This missed opportunity to share the painting with others was, it turns out, to the detriment of both men. It was only through dedicated service to others that Niggle could learn the discipline he would need to apply to his own work, and it was only with the additions of Parrish's unique perspective that this particular version of his creation could be realized. For Parrish, Niggle's vision becomes a place of delight and renewal. Through cooperative collaboration, not only have Parrish and Niggle healed themselves and created beauty, they've also created an opportunity for others to do the same so the product of their collaboration will benefit others beyond themselves. 
Parrish hints that when his wife arrives, she will make her own contributions to the work. The house is finished now, as well as we could make it, but I should like to show it to her. She'll be able to make it better, I expect. More homely. The story ends with the second voice reporting that a stay in Niggles Parish is doing wonders in the convalescence of more and more patients. At the beginning of the story, Niggles' romantic and visionary temperament leads him to see his creative work as being in competition with the rest of his life, from the needs of his neighbors to his garden to the maintenance of his own house. He uses his artistic talents merely for the sake of personal gratification and reluctantly sacrifices his work when he's forced to deal with an emergency that seems to have been partly of his own making. His stay in the workhouse shows that if he had approached such sacrifices with the right attitude, he could have gained the perspective and strength of character that would have allowed him to make more progress on his painting, instead of detracting from it. In co-creating the land of Niggle's parish with his neighbor, Niggle further sees that creativity can be perfected and even transcended through collaboration. But again, this is something that can only be achieved through relation to others. And finally, when Niggle is at last finished with the world of his painting, he leaves behind a place that others can inhabit and continue to develop. In the view Tolkien expresses through this story, creativity cannot be isolated from one's experience of life. Discipline, responsibility, and self-sacrifice are as necessary to artistic pursuits as they are to any other goal. Additionally, we see that the aim of life, including art, is properly other-oriented. An artist's personal vision can only be fully expressed if their creative endeavors are ordered accordingly. The aim of art is to be experienced by others. Art can only approach the finished state if undertaken with the end user's experience in mind, in service of the audience. In this view, the consequences of pointless self-indulgent niggling are conceived as not only practical or aesthetic, but moral. It reduces the tremendous potential of creative endeavor to the temporary satisfaction the individual artist takes in working on it. If you enjoyed this look at one of Tolkien's less well-known works, give it a thumbs up before you are called to start a journey of your own. If you feel called to frolic merrily in the collaborative world of my other videos, consider subscribing, or you can check out my Patreon page by following the link below. Thank you to everyone for watching, especially my patrons, including Catherine Berry, Dr. Newton Wen, Sophie's Boy, John H. Austin Jr., Gandalf the Grey, Marcel Ribeiro, Nick Riello, Kevin Gilstadt, Jeremy Buckingham, Dorwin Gray, Brendan Mooney, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelvestring, Luke, Joel Bion, and Jared Carver. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and enjoy reading some Tolkien.